and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. The Hello! <laughs> The creator of the creator of the upcom of the upcoming five E overhaul known as Frostmark. The one and only Rebecca Shellen. I'm hoping that I got it right this time. <laughs> how are you how are you doing to today for me and tonight for you? Uh I'm doing great. Mm -hmm. I spend most of the day prepping a uh player of mine for an upcoming campaign and that's always super fun diving deep into character creation and backstory creation mm -hmm. so it's been great all right so i like to open with the humble beginnings as as is tradition oh. around here mm -hmm. um with that in mind i'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick oh um, okay, let's take us back to 16-year-old me. I was an extremely awkward child. Couldn't, I didn't have much self-confidence. I didn't know how to express myself. My English was absolutely terrible. <laughs> and, but I've always loved reading fantasy books. I consumed this in an alarming rate. Uh, but I was still not ready to like accept nerdum about myself. But tr still try to fit in with the cool crowd, if that makes sense. And so when I got new friends in high school, they were like, you know, come and join us for some Pathfinder. And I was like, I don't know if I want to be that kind of person that I secretly know that I am. Um, but I went there. I took over as one of the NPCs in the game, which was like a rogue. And the first role I ever did was that I critted a minotaur with a sneak attack and dealt like 50 damage. <laughs> and it was such a rush of emotions and, and happiness um, that I got interested in it. But I was still really awkward and shy about it. So one of the guys took me aside and offered to do a one-on-one -on -one campaign with me in GURPS of all of the systems. And it started with being having no backstory at all, you know, parents being dead, of course. Uh, some kind of lonely wizard apprentice. And during the course of a year from that to becoming a literal god <laughs> through, through roleplay, and after that, I, I just noticed the positive effects that it had on me, the, the self-confidence, the empathy, the um, ability to, to work in a team, the ability to express myself and think about outside the box and imagine myself in other people, in other places, and the escapism of it all. And, uh, you know, I, I was hooked. I couldn't stop. So here I am. 10 years later, doing yeah. this. Yeah. And to be fair, to be fair, when, to be fair, when it comes to that, when it comes to that first role, um, what it, that ends up, that ends up bringing up one of the mantras that I, that I have here in the temple. The dice gods show no mercy. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yes. True. Well, I, the dice are a, the dice are are a wonderful model of equality because mm -hmm. it does not matter your your ra your race gender height weight occupation po point of origin the dice gods hate you. <laughs> I usually say that the dice giveth and taketh <laughs> away. Gr granted, granted, some people some people I've met they seem to hate more often than more often than others. But it, it, but it is, it is a mercurial business. Um. So with with that in mind, get, um, was it just a was it just a natural progression going from um path going from Pathfinder to fi to Five E, or were or were there um, other games that you had that you had dipped into over the years? Oh, so many. 
I had both the blessing and the curse of having a very chaotic <laughs> group of friends who played role-playing games. Um, our problem was that nothing could ever stick. So we would get excited about something new, and we would start up a game, and then we would play one to perhaps five sessions, and then it would die down, and then we find something else that excited us, and then we would play that. So I, I played D&D, Pathfinder, Legends of the Five Rings, Warhammer, several different versions of it, um, Star Wars, several different versions, Pokemon Tabletop United, um... Uh, it, there's so many. I can, I, like, mm -hmm. There's like 20 systems that I've gone through. Um, you did. You did pop me for a se for a second when by bringing up um, Elf by bringing up L five R. Given my, given my own history with that entry, um, and this, although although the the usual with the usual wisdom is applicable, um, lions are jerks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I play crab. I um, I play scorpion. Mm. So no, so no. Well, nobody trusts me anyways. So, so <laughs> I may, I may as well, I may as well play, I may as well play the the clan that's the clan that's the biggest backstabbers in, in the in, entire empire. Mm. Oh. But, but it did give me an opportunity to see a lot of different mm -hmm. design choices, mm -hmm. and I developed a taste of. Um, I de developed a taste for these design choices, and I started home brewing. Like when we did have like a fad, I was like, I don't like that. Can we change this to to this? Mm -hmm. And um, then it also turned into ideas of settings, and I got this idea for a setting that grew into Frostmark. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, what system am I going to use for this? To just GM for my friends. It just started off like that. Mm -hmm. And I thought between the Warhammer fantasy that I just came out, if I just create something really light and completely homebrewy, or if I just take D&D 5e and change some stuff about it. And uh, for several reasons, I decided to go with D&D 5e in the end. Mm -hmm. And one, one per, given given the um, given one of the main mo given one of the main motifs of. Um, of Frostmark is the is the weakening of a of a magical bit of a barrier that was keep that was keeping a lot of the supernatural out. Um, mm -hmm. I can't. I there's a part of me that can't help but wonder if um, if things like the so, things like the Souls um, series of video games were a, were a bit of an inspiration. Hmm. I mean, I would say several things were kind of an inspiration. I have um, always enjoyed, like, living, gritting words that feel realistic to you. So that's kind of where the basis of these 11 kingdoms and just humans and the all the political strife and stuff like that. Um, and I, I would definitely say that there's a little bit of Witcher in it and a little bit of Warhammer with the with the gods and a little bit of Dark Souls. There's, there's a lot in there, but I think I've created, like, a... Uh, a chaotic pot that has created something, you know, unique mm -hmm. in the end. And I think I think that's the benefit of jumping around between diff between different systems, mm. especially since in doing that you don't you you don't have you don't fall into you don't fall into the trap. I see a lot I see a lot of people fall into in terms of how one approaches fantasy. Mm. Complacency, absolutely. Because um, I had, <clears throat> I've, a term that, a term that I've used off and on over the years is what I call the Tolkien melting pot. Oh, mm. oh yeah. Not to, yeah. not that I'm slagging on the works of, of Tolkien. I love, I love his work, no, but. Absolutely iconic. I, but I'm, I'm more refer, I'm more referring to, to the, to the idea that, so, that something fantasy has to be with has to be within that particular style of fantasy that very um br that very british isles view of, view of fa view of fantasy yeah um, melting pot of certain races and then good versus evil um and well especially since D especially since D&D is is D&D's um setup is a kit, is a kit bash of just 
a bunch of stuff that Gygax and Arneson happen to like. Um, yes. That'd be Tolkien, Moorcock, Lieber, um, Van and Vance. Mm -hmm. And well, the pro the problem is with all with all of those authors I just mentioned, um, the f the fact that they were fantasy authors is the first and last thing they have in common. <laughs> <laughs> So. You're not. You're not going. You're. You're not going to. You're not going to pick up a. You're not going to pick up a a a copy of a copy of a of a Conan book and and assume and assume it takes place in Middle Earth is what I'm saying. Definitely, that, that's for sure. Ooh, Conan uh, is a rough read. Um, the the and well, the, well, the Eternal Champion meta meta series from uh, Moorcock's work. That's a whole. That's a whole discussion in and of itself. Hmm. Oh. But, with but I can but I can see but in in but because of the fact that you had that you had jumped between a bunch of settings, you got a and I'm pretty I'm pretty sure even before that you already had a fair bit of exposure just from diving into fantasy novels of the of different styles. Oh, yes. Oh. That yeah. That's for sure. So, when it can, so you're so Frostmark, as I understand it, is an overhaul of of D and D fifth edition. And yes, what I'm curious about is, did it start out as just a, a as just going to be a slightly modified version, but that but then things got out of hand, or were you always planning to do this big to do this big overhaul? Uh, well. First of all, it was just a project to GM for my friends, mm -hmm. right? And then I started seeing a little bit of a glimmer of potential in there. And so I started my Twitch channel, Bex Chillin, mm -hmm. as in C-H-I-L-L-I-N. Mm -hmm. And I just started streaming the process of working on it and seeing if anyone else found it cool. Mm -hmm. And three years later... <laughs> Here I am, and have a lot of people who who encourage me in what I do. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it kind of grew with the with the community and in my own head as well. But I already knew what I wanted from D and D Five E. It was to take the the lore, make it my own, and then change character creation to make it more character focused and narrative focused, mm -hmm. uh, increase character customization in it and increase the depth of the system a little bit and mm -hmm. introduce something new to spellcasting. And the challenge has been to get to that point uh, rather than to figure out what I wanted and with uh, user experience friendliness in mind, as soon as you start increasing the complexity of something, you need to make sure that it's understandable and approachable and consumable by by other people in a short amount of time so that has certainly been the the challenge mm -hmm. uh for this last three years yeah now let i think i think that's as good a time as any to, to get into that now mm -hmm. this the way in the standard method the vanilla the vanilla method that i'm going to refer to it from here from here on um it's typically a case of generate ability scores, pick your pick your race, pick your background, pick your class, and that and that's it. Um, yes. Whereas, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, the approach that the approach that you're doing, um, things are significantly more segmented. Mm. Yes, there are more steps to it. That's for sure. Um. I want to start off by saying that 5e or the vanilla way of doing it is fantastic for newbies and fantastic when you just want to create a short campaign or just start playing with your friends this night, right? Just throw something together. But what I've created is for those people who want to play a 5e kind of experience, but those who care more about their character in the narrative and their customization. Often when I have created a character in, in 5e, I've always felt like I needed to constrain and restrain my concept that I have in my head to what the system allows me to do. Mm -hmm. 
And Frostmark is kind of a response to that. I first and most important step in creating a character in Frostmark is decide upon a concept and the bare bones of a backstory. Mm -hmm. Because everything you do after this step should uh, invoke and make this backstory and personality come true. Which means that there is a lot more character customization. Um, you know, there is, you buy your ability scores. Uh, the ability scores are more varied uh, to explain your character in a better way. Uh, the skill system has more ranks of advancement, easier for users to use. There's more backgrounds. The class system of of D and D has been broken up and become way easier to navigate. Multiclassing is is easier, mm -hmm. and you there's no spell casting ability modifier. You decide upon that. There's no spell list for the classes. There's no spell table. You control. Almost every um, every number and word that is mm -hmm. on your character sheet. Yeah, and one of the, now I'll get to, I'll get to spells and I'll get to spells in a moment. But mm -hmm. um, one of the other th one of the other things that I co that I couldn't help but that I couldn't help but notice is the is the fact that when it came to when it came to the standard set of the standard set of ability scores. Not only are not only are you not only are you do are you doing a few um, deviations from from the basic six, but if the um, teaser document is any indication, you have more of them. Let me see: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. Eight, eight, nine ability scores. Yes. And was it a was it a was it a case where where you had where did you initially try to to do it within six, but ha but but had to exp had to expand on it? No, I I always wanted to change the ability scores in five e because I of course there comes a point where things get out of hand, complicated and too much. But I never felt like the six ability scores in D and D depend, considering like how large the a, the system in it is in itself that it was enough to explain your character. I never felt happy with how there's only one social stat charisma that just decides everything about you socially or how intelligence and wisdom was everything about your mental aptitude. And I also thought to myself that it kind of buries into the system the thought that there are three physical stats and there's two stats from your mental interactions and one set for your social interactions and what that creates uh, in the system itself, what kind of thoughts it, it, it evokes. Um, for me, whenever I'm doing a campaign or, or GMing, uh, combat encounters and social encounters and um, mental encounters has as much weight for me narratively as, you know, combat encounters has mm -hmm. so i wanted to create a balanced outlook on all of these different challenges we do in in rpgs to make them equal in the eyes of the system mm -hmm. but also explain explain your your character in a more in-depth way yeah the other thing the other thing i'd be remiss if i didn't bring up is is the is the return of skill of skill of skill ranks, um, and mm. instead instead of doing the whole oh you're oh you're proficient and now you're and now you're an now you're an expert, mm. which expertise ri expertise rarely sh rarely showed up in my in my experience. Um, yes, but. When it came when it came to skill ranks, was it was it to further emphasize that some people some that it's not a case of people being good at something or not good at something, but but the degrees of um, oh of proficiency. yes, I love I love shades of gray, mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely. You can be good at something and even better at something. Um, and it also came for me just playing D and D five e. Like we, I had a longer campaign, and then there was a 
uh, it was a longer break in this campaign where, you know, we went off for a few months and just did our own things. And my character was off doing their profession. And I asked my, my DM, like, hey, shouldn't I get better at this? Because I've been doing it for such a long time, right? I'm spending so much time with it. And they said, but there's nothing in the system that allows for it. You just need to find an opportunity to get expertise. And I'm like... I don't like this. Can we not change this? Can we not introduce more variables here? More more shades of gray? Can I just incrementally get better in some way? And I had that thought with me uh, when I created um, Frostmark. Mm -hmm. uh, that I wanted there to be more, more ranks when it comes to skills. And between the setup with with the with an expand with this expanded set of ability scores and the um, and the rank-based skills. I'm, I'm beginning to get a bit curious if, um, if world, if the World of Darkness or just any game in the storyteller system was an influence. I don't think necessarily anyone. I, I just, I really like character creation. I, I, I like. Characters. I like creating a character where I feel like the concept that I have in my mind matches that it's on the paper, and then there is a way for me to improve and go on this character journey, and um, that these that these developments that I do in roleplay also shows up on the character sheet. So I think it's more of an amalgamation of what I like to do when I roleplay and all of those inspirations and sources that I've gone through in the past. Which to be fair I to be fair I can see that and that's some. Um, that's definitely something where the where the class where the class design of D D fifth edition is going to run into a weakness. Um Oh yeah, no system is perfect. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um <laughs> the I'm pr I'm pretty sh I'm pretty sure some I'm pretty sure some some OSR people would argue otherwise, but they're OSR, so their so their opinion is is acknowledged and ignored. Um, <laughs> but the but the the perfect the perfect example I I always give when it comes to sh when it comes to showing that um that 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 the that 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 particular class design has its limits is. A rather infamous section in the Dungeon Master's Guide. One mm -hmm. one that has one that has been my whipping boy for five years. Where they, oh. It was it was in the part where they talked about other t other types of fantasy, and and pr and specifically brought in Wuxia, which um, which is going which mm -hmm. is going to be a red fl is going to be a red flag in a second. But it it talked it talked about how you, how you could. How you could easily reflavor the paladin to make a samurai character, mm. and um, <laughs> putting putting aside the fact that trying that trying to mix um, trying to mix samurai fantasy and wuxia are not the same thing at all. Yes. <laughs> there. Um, the idea the idea of the idea of mixing lawful stupid with uh, with with a with a archetype that is not implicitly supernatural, um, is a, is a case of what the hell are you doing? Um, Very true. And, and I, it what it, I wasn't surprised at all when it only when it only took a few months before people started homebrewing samurai classes, because try, mm. uh, and I've I've seen that whole thing before of oh oh it'll work you just you just have to reflavor it. Yeah, you could, yeah you mm -hmm. could, but um, you ever hear the ex you ever hear the expression "lipstick on a pig"? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. At uh, a certain point, it's gonna feel awkward. Well, no matter how much lipstick you put on a pig, it's still a pig. Mm. But get getting getting pet. So the and especially given the especially given the fact that. I get the I get the feeling that a lot of the characters that you that you um, that you've created mm -hmm. in both in both your spare time and for the purposes of Frostmark don't necessarily fit the paradigm of of um of the of assumptions with cer with certain class um setups 
especially. I don't really see it that way. Like, I created a person mm -hmm. with a story, and then I just tried to express them in the system in the best way I could. But with D and D, because it's so friendly to new people and uh if you just want to throw something together it means there's also a lot of restraints and i just couldn't feel like the these people that i have imagined could be expressed adequately through those restraints square peg into a round hole mm, kind of like that yeah yeah which that does bring that does bring me to to one up to one other aspect, <clears throat> and mm -hmm. that that is a, that is ability origins. Yes. Um. So, what is would ability origins be the closest thing to classes or or, or archetypes and, and the like? And um, how and ob obviously obviously going into how they're how they're different would be would be a bit would be a bit more lengthy. But how? But how exact? How exactly is how exactly is that going to that phase going to work compared to the other parts of character creation? Uh, well, first of all, they kind of are like the classes and D and D five E, but I treat them differently. So it was important for me to change the name, not only for getting like a a mental bite between the two as two different concepts uh, but also to describe that it does not define you it's just an origin for which some of your abilities hail from mm -hmm. and i renamed the classes also as adjectives or events that has happened in your past mm -hmm. instead of being paladin as a profession or bard as a profession now instead you're just artistic Mm -hmm. as uh, the ability origin artistry or you have made a divine oath as a as a paladin mm -hmm. and then you go through this uh, process of in your character creation you together with your GM discuss which uh, origins your abilities should have where they should come from mm -hmm. considering what makes sense with your backstory and you can start with up to four of these uh, but you can also gain them as you continue playing. And I removed every obstacle in the book from multiclassing, making you, uh, making it so that you create um, your own character expression by just choosing those abilities that makes the most sense for you. And instead of starting all the time at level one and having to pick up these abilities that we don't actually want, but uh, we will have to take just to get to that juicy ability later on that we actually think works with our characters, you can just jump over all of that mm -hmm. and just handpick those abilities that works with your character's concept. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes... When it comes to when it comes to ability origins, I I specifically mm -hmm. want to go into um, advancement. Given given oh. given the given the goals that you've had with with this particular um, variant on character creation, mm -hmm. with since since leveling up gives get you get something from from one of your ability origins. Um, yes. The question the question that I have is is it is it a I'm assuming that it's a case where where you have where you have a bit of a sh where each origin has a bit of a short list that you're pi that you're picking from almost akin to a talent tree. Yes, uh every every ability origin has a <clears throat> group of leveled abilities that is in theme with that ability origin and then there is some a selection of subtypes if you want to uh focus on a specific aspect of that mm -hmm. ability origin. All right. Um uh, so, if I, if I may, if I may, I'd like to, I'd like to pick your head, head on this. Um, mm -hmm. Now, obviously, my moniker is is of the monk because I end up playing, I end up playing monks quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. But in in your in this particular system, what um, mm -hmm. what ability origins would be would be recommended for someone who wanted to do the um, the pug that kind of pugilist um, fantasy. 
I mean, you can't go with discipline, which is basically uh, monk as it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can jump over those abilities and pick those abilities that things you work with your character. Mm -hmm. You can splash in some tactics, some, some fighter to make it work. Um, to to add action search, for example, if you would want that, mm -hmm. uh, or you can go into soul weapon, which is like Magus in Pathfinder, who mm -hmm. makes your magical uh, makes your fists more more magical and and uh, makes you more geared towards casting spells as well. Uh, you can uh, hop into power and add some rage and become <laughs> a bit more angry, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there's, I mean, um, there's everything and anything um, with added homebrewing um, mm -hmm. and supplements in, in the future. So mm -hmm. for me, what's important is just what's in the, your backstory. Yeah. Uh, and and so I've danced around it a a significant amount, but let's mm -hmm. let's get into spell casting mm. now, because because of the far more freeform nature of of um of the system as we've covered it thus far. Mm -hmm. Um, the first question that I that I'd, ha that I'd ask is. Are you are you doing the spell slot setup that it that is seen in um that is seen in co in core, or are you are you taking a different approach? Yes, I I am definitely doing the the spell slot. Every caster is the same kind of caster, mm -hmm. which uh, no preparation of spells, and you just have spell slots and a list of spells known. Mm -hmm. uh, here is that you choose your spell casting ability. Uh, score between the mental and the social stats mm -hmm. <clears throat> you cannot flex cast sadly and there is no spell list tied to any of the classes instead it's just a master spell list mm -hmm. you create your spell list through your character's concept instead mm -hmm. and then every level that you take has attached to it a spell casting magnitude uh, which decide how uh, how big of a pool of a resource you have um, access to this level to purchase spell slots, uh, spells known, and uh, cantrips. Mm -hmm. So more martial, martial classes, of course, have uh, less uh, of the spell casting resource. Mm -hmm. And those classes who are geared towards magic have way more. Mm -hmm. And within within that within that particular setup mm -hmm. um, would would it also would it also be the case where um where the where the spell the, this universal spell list is set up where um where spells where spells themselves can be adequately adequately um customized as a as a character sees fit Oh yes, just talk to your GM and explain to them why it makes sense considering your character's concept or the story told so far or just the backstory mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the GM should... If there is a, a a balanced and rational reason for why, then absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would like to go into the, to the resource that, you're, that you've that you've brought that you brought up regarding spell casting that being mm -hmm. souls yes um how ex how exact how exactly does that factor into spell casting ah yes um so th this has to do with my particular setting mm -hmm. and uh, how I set up uh the the world uh lore if that makes sense mm -hmm. um so it has strong ties to that but it basically means that all magical um, power comes from souls, which is the spark of life, your potential, your ability to, to do change in the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you use your soul all the time in, uh, in the game, even if you're not a uh, spellcaster. Uh, a lot of abilities in the in the feel rather supernatural. The ability to not take as much damage just because you become angry. 
um, having an aura of uh, healing or protecting magic as a uh, as a paladin and finding the weaknesses in armors and dealing massive amounts of damage with uh, sneak attack. All of that I flavor as its expressions of your own soul. Mm -hmm. But to cast magic, you need more than just that. You need more soul power to power these magical expressions. And that is souls. Mm -hmm. And uh, you acquire a soul from a corpse that has not been dead for more than uh, six minutes. And you have a magical tattoo on your body that you get to customize exactly how it looks and which color it lights up in and where it is. And it kind of grows with you organically as you gain power as a, as a spellcaster. And <clears throat> this is basically your magical potential that you store in your soul mark. And every time you cast a spell that is of first level or higher, uh, that is not ritual casting, you do a soul check. And that is, uh, you bring out this little red globule of light from your shining soul mark, and you turn this thing into a magical expression. And during that time, you can lose concentration of the soul. So you make this roll against the DC of the spell, and if you succeed, you just bring back the soul uh, safely to your soul mark. And if you fail, that soul disappears into, a into the afterlife. Mm -hmm. So this makes it so that I've added another component to spellcasting. I've removed all the material components. Now it's just souls. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a risk every time you decide to cast magic. And especially so when it comes to the higher level ones. You need to ask yourself, is it worth it? Do I have enough juice to fail this roll? Mm -hmm. And uh, I've also cranked up magic to balance this out. I converted all the spells tables for a full caster, half caster, and quarter caster in the Indy 5e. And I made sure that in general characters in Frostmark have more magic than those uh, stereotypes. Mm -hmm. But it's a risk and reward thing. You have more power, but every time you cast magic, there's a chance you lose the ability to do so. Mm -hmm. And it ties heavily into the lore. So I guess I gave spellcasting more flavor to it. In D&D 5e, I always thought to myself, oh my god, this is so stable. And it's always there. And it's so mechanical. Um, and it's kind of bland. It's kind of bland. I think it felt that it was very bland. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to add some spice to it. Yep. So w now within... Now, um, one of... One since we've we've touched we've touched on it quite a bit, but I think I think going into I think going into the set going into the setting would mm -hmm. be would be a bit would be a bit apropos, especially since well, <laughs> one thing that I've picked on D and D over over the over the years for is its inability to, for for lack of a better term, shit or get off the pot regarding what kind of fantasy and what kind of setting it has, <laughs> which I I think is I think is the, I think is. A oh, cause sorry. of a lot of a cause of a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. um, True. But w within within the setting of Frostmark, I think I think it would be safe for me safe for me to assume that um, that it is that the, most of the player characters are going to be humans, um, and what and what what nationality you come from has more importance than it would in vanilla. Yes, definitely. I've created. Um, at least three custom backgrounds for each kingdom that you can come from, for mm -hmm. example. And um, I mean, this the, I would call this the standard campaign of Frostmark. It's just starting as, you know, humans experiences, uh, experiencing this vast change in how your world works and functions as this fire barrier breaks down and the other gods are returning magic is returning and monsters and other human races are returning which you thought didn't exist mm -hmm. uh, i find that to be very exciting mm -hmm. uh personally uh but i mean just as i said with everything else um i wanted to create frostmark to be very customizable if you're not interested or get excited by Frostmark's lore, then just take the system as it is and just tie it uh tie it to your own lore or don't 
play as only humans, add a another race into the mix. Just make sure it makes sense immersively, or just don't play in this world, the specific specific planet. Play on another planet and don't experience these these problems. But the the lore that I'm providing for this first iteration of Frostmark, its first release, is、mm -hmm. geared towards this standard campaign、uh, as humans on Frostmark.、Mm -hmm. Now, with and even even within the, even within that, given given the、um, fact that there that there's a lot of emphasis on the kingdoms, would it be fair、mm -hmm. of me? To, would it be fair to me to say that, um, that a, that a, that one per, one particular avenue you want you wanted to explore is, um, f is the intrigue between diff, between different factions, and how and、oh. how they're interpreting this changing world. Yes, absolutely. I I try to create a world that has several different movers and shakers. That is already strife that is happening, be it either from open warfare or politics or racism or you know humans being humans, <laughs> and then how all of these factions react to and navigate and deal with this change of the world.、Mm -hmm. And that's up to the the GM to to decide. And <clears throat> given 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 the given those movers and shakers, this this um this does bring me to an issue that I've seen that I've seen I've seen occur I've seen occur in other in other games that have that have a very strong emphasis on on the on those sort of faction relationships.、Mm -hmm. And that that is um how that is how to how to in, how to make sure that. The that the party is it, the party is able to feel like a a part of that. Now, something like L five R already has an e already has an easy out. Just make the party members、um, emerald magistrates. Um, mm -hmm. But the the key thing is that the key thing with this is the potential reasons for what for why a bunch of different people might um might band might band together to do to do advent to do their particular version of adventuring. Especially with some、mm -hmm. backgrounds.、Mm. Yeah, absolutely.、Uh, I I actually find that conversation in itself to be really exciting to explore as a story.、Mm -hmm. um, what sets the players apart from other people?、Mm -hmm. And、uh, what I've done is、uh, another thing that I didn't like about Five E when I played it is that you know guards are guards and the archmage has the spell of list and this is the the priest apprentice. All of them are such a low CR, most of them. And I, I wanted to change that to make the world、uh, more immersive when it comes to you know the players.、Um, Power level versus a god force or these specific movers and shakers and these factions that it should not everyone around you should feel like fragile ants at a certain point,、mm -hmm. and、um, that's kind of what Frostmark also questions like why are you special? What makes you special? And it's often have to do with the options our players take that they cite. To be larger than life, they decide to butt their heads into situations they shouldn't butt themselves into, and、uh, choose to care about things that other people would say you're crazy.、Uh, but I also have、uh, in the system in itself different power levels that you can start at. You have mundane, heroic, and champion, where I discuss in the GM section of what kind of campaign you should expect from that and what kind of. Characters you should create from that.、Mm -hmm. um, a mundane campaign indeed could be just members of a guard force or just normal ass people in the system, just trying to survive in a crazy world. Whilst champions, you are immediately、uh, different from the rest. Immediately, we're born with talents that everyone else recognizes around you that you are different and has put you into a position. Uh, that allows you to utilize your influence and power.、Mm -hmm. Now, to further with that with that kind of thing with that kind of thing in mind, have you <coughs> in in long in long term campaigns have you have you have you given consideration to 
what to what to how you'd accommodate if some if somebody want if somebody at a high enough level wanted to wanted to start claiming a claiming a stake within 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 Frostmark for themselves, i.e. Oh. i.e. things like things like holdings, which has been in D and D over the years, but it's but um its presence has been reduced. You kind of read my mind. <laughs> Uh, I have always been super excited about having that option for players, and I've played a little bit of um, Song of Ice and Fire and seen the holding system there. Of course, I checked out Strongholds uh, by Matthew Colville, and it's definitely something that I want to expand with Frostmark, mm -hmm. with the political and, and warfare kind of um, thematic parts that I already have in the lore. That yeah. is something I want to add. I I will I will note my favorite template when it comes to this kind of thing was it was mm -hmm. in a um in a re in a retro clone esque um type of game called Adventure Conqueror King System by um Alexander Ooh. Macris. I should definitely um, write that it, up. It is it is using the um it was it's using the I did review it a long time ago and the and Macris is a is a buddy of mine but um mm -hmm. the appro its approach is that is a th is a three tiered setup. You start out as just your standard adventurers, then you're a you're a bigger deal adventurer who's got who's got his own followers, and then you're mm -hmm. somebody who's got who's got th who's got their own holding, whether it be a castle, a mage's tower, or something like that, with with well more followers, which mm -hmm. which um tied it which tied into a mass combat system that was utilized as well. Cool. Um. What was it called? Adventure and Adventure Conqueror King System. Conqueror King. All right, I should definitely check it out. Um. But, bec and bec because um I because the way of the, the way I've always seen it, and you you've probably been in the mindset as well that after you after you reach a certain level, you've already you've done a handful of adventures, you've helped you've helped a bunch of people. Your name should be get your name should be getting out there at some point. <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, I also discussed that in my GM section that, you know, not always uh, should a reward for a certain milestone or task completed be like money or magical items. It can just be a social connection or a title given or some kind of social advantage mm -hmm. could mean the absolute world for your characters and uh, their their life. And I also discussed the difference between just sheer power in in combat and just doing the the right decisions or caring or having the right people around you so mm -hmm. yeah no definitely there's something i wanna wanna expand towards mm -hmm. and the obviously obviously give, given some of the given some of the research i'm get i'm guessing that the idea of the idea of some form of ma of mass combat or something beyond skirmish level has been something you've been considering Oh yes, for for the future, absolutely, mm -hmm. because we have these huge kingdoms and these gods and the the church and their military. So, mm -hmm. simulating uh, warfare is definitely something I want to add in the future. Yeah, just 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 making sure that it doesn't end up feeling like a full like a full on war game. <laughs> Oh yes, absolutely. Um, having the players still roleplay, I always say as a mantra in my games that roleplay doesn't end when combat starts, and that is definitely something I want to bring into my warfare rules if I ever get to that point. I I certainly I certainly appreciate th that since um, I don't know when this started, but there's been a but there's been a there's been there's been this idea for for a while that um that Role playing and combat are mutually exclusive. Oh yes, no, and, that's um, that's a mistake. <clears throat> if combat feels boring because you like role play, then you're not doing role play. <laughs> well, I think a, I think a lot of I, th I think a I think a lot of people o overestim overestimate how what how much storytelling you can have in just a fight scene. Um, Oh, I remember. Absolutely. Um, Robin D. Loss has gone into has gone into this a lot with with his with his um feng shui rpg as well as his book blowing up the mm -hmm. movies um and to use an to use an example everybody's everybody's familiar with consider um i'll, I'll bring up star wars for the for 
for an example on this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Consider the consider the fact that while ev- while every jet while every Jedi has some has some form of lightsaber, not all mm-hmm. they're not going to be using them the same way. There's there are there are seven codified um, fighting styles, and each of mm-hmm. and the choice of which one to use can re- can reflect um, one's personality just as much as how just as much as how they carry themselves outside of fights. Sure. <clears throat> um. You have you have the fact that Dooku uses uh, Makashi, which is v- which mm-hmm. is very much a fencing centric form. I so, thought it was always Makashi, but yeah. All right. Potato, potato. Um. <laughs> Jim So for. Uh... <laughs> For Anakin, yeah, Jem Jem So and a, and a bit of and a bit of Jarkai, which isn't isn't one of the isn't one of the seven forms. It's a sister of it, mm-hmm. but that's ju- that just covers um two sa- two saber fighting. Um, I usually I usually desc- the best way that I d- that I describe Jem they describe Shien and Jem So to people is that it's m- that it's more akin to kendo or broadsword fencing. Hmm. Absolutely, uh, agreed. Um, and of and of course, whenever when I, I remember discussing that with some of my students and bringing up the fact that that kind of fight that kind of fighting style, you have no idea how 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 act, how terrifying it is to put that to put that on someone like Vader who has arms and legs that won't get tired. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. Oh, uh, we're. Whereas obviously, obviously being a squishy, you will. <laughs> yes. Uh, but give, but given, and ev- and of course, there, of course, there are entire conversations on how, on how fighting styles and fighting schools are are an influence in, in in, in any um in any wuxia story you happen to pick up. Mm-hmm. Um. It, and give and given the fact that just with kung fu alone there are there are anywhere anywhere between 300 and 1500 variants of that i'm not surprised <clears throat> and because 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 of that um a one size fits all style um is i think i think is important as, just as much for role playing as it as it is for well while making characters interesting in combat. Mm-hmm. True. Oh. But with but with that in with that in mind, um, since you since you mentioned you mentioned C you mentioned C R, is is it a is it a case where where some of the some of the C R for for human and human like characters is go, is going to be um is going to be bumped up? So it so the high so high CR encounters aren't just monsters. Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, if if our player characters could possibly reach those high CR levels, then why can't not anybody else reach those as well? So I I give um, some recommendations to what certain positions in different military organizations would probably have as a as a CR. Mm-hmm. And I also have more than a hundred NPC stat blocks that inhabit the world as guards, as bandits, as uh, people of the church, and so on and so forth that have anything from below CR one to above CR twelve. Mm-hmm. Now, when it c- when it comes to when it comes to that, if if um. Let me let me posit a scenario a scenario with you and and see where and see where you'd put this particular C, this particular CR. Mm-hmm. Um, say for, say for instance there is there the, the say for instance the party is asked to dispatch some someone who will who um is decl- is declaring a certain a certain very important bridge as his own. And mm-hmm. he says he and will not and will not give it up until some until someone beats until someone beats him in a duel. Um, <laughs> this but a flesh wound. Oh, actually, to be to be fair, I was I wasn't necessarily going. I, that's it's close enough, but I was but I was actually going for um, Musashi Bo Benke. <laughs> I I don't know who that is, but um, okay, fair. But the. 
the re the problem the problem is he's he happens to be really 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 good at sword fighting, so everybody who, everybody mm -hmm. who keeps trying ends up ends up coming back in pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, what so, if let, if you want if you wanted to make it a a high level in, that kind of thing a high level encounter, um, what CR would you would you put it at if would you put it at relative to the party relative to the party um i don't think too much about what what is relative to the party mm -hmm. uh, what i think it's relative to the world mm -hmm. and if my players walk into a situation where they're way out of their their league it's either because they were way too cocky um or that is just bad luck and mm -hmm. i need to come up with as a gm a, a interesting story of how that necessarily don't need to end in death mm -hmm. right um so i i with my gm section and also as a gm myself i kind of treat that there's an interesting conversation between shaping every single scenario for your characters to be perfectly balanced mm -hmm. to be hard to the point where they sweat but they always come out victorious in the end or 90 percent of the time this happens with if the go uh, dice gods are in their on their side mm -hmm. uh, but i take a little bit of a a break uh, from that in in frostmark and i discuss a balance between that for because you need to bend the rules a little bit to make an interesting story. You cannot throw CR bunch of CR ten people at my level one uh, players at all times and think that's going to be a good campaign. But I also argue that we break immersion and we tell a not as a a compelling story if we always craft and care about the power level of uh, your players. Mm -hmm. The world is a dangerous place. There are scary people out there. There are also weaker people out there. And it's all about how you navigate that. So in general, to answer your question, I would say that you have CR1 to CR5 as lower, um, you know, the first positions in an organization and then five to 10 is slightly higher and then 10 to 15 is more of a veterans and then 15 to 20, you have the best in their fields. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with, that, with, with all of that taken into account, um, what, are you shoot, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the books? <laughs> well, considering how much I have already, Mm -hmm. We're probably looking at about a thousand to one thousand two hundred pages, somewhere around those lines. Bet between three books. Between three books, mm -hmm. indeed. Yeah, I, I um, even th even though you're doing this as PDF, I seriously doubt anybody wants to be lugging around a thousand page book. Oh no, absolutely, absolutely not. Uh, for this Kickstarter, um, considering the amount of money um, that is required <laughs> to print beautifully colorful hardcover books, mm -hmm. I thought about the the quality of what I'm doing um, um, content-wise. So we're only doing digital release for now, but I, I hope for the future that it's also going to be hardcover. So I, I already thought about what my books would look like in like physical. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I will certainly, I will certainly be looking forward to, s to seeing how, to seeing how, this, to seeing how it develops, and, and what, and what sort of, what sort of insanity com comes about. Because, well, one of the other, one of the other fun parts of character creation is seeing what sort of ridiculous builds people can come up with, which is how we oh. got the legend of Pun Pun. <laughs> Oh, I I definitely agree with that, and I, I hope for the future. You know, we can add more sub types as well, subclasses, and and more classes as well, and just continue to to increase the the customization in the game. Um, but it is a little bit more of a challenge to create a character and to to GM the system. But I think the effort you put into it rewards you threefold back just because of the immersion that you get back from it. Yeah. At the very at the very least in a system like this, I could I I could run a um 
as we call it, a palerer without without my a palerer archetype without my G, without my GM wanting my head on a plate. <laughs> yes, uh, my my um, always advice is to gather like-minded individuals. If everyone wants to create min-max characters, then that's fine because then there's harmony in the group. But if you got a bunch of role players, then you have uh, uh, other kinds of uh, motivations and goals. So just just have a group that is in harmony with each other, and you are fine. Well, just remember, you can't spell harmony without harm. <laughs> Fair. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. It was a pleasure. It was really fun. Thank you for letting and, me here. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further delve into um, Frostmark or or just to laugh at the bard getting killed for the umpteenth time, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I am drinking right now. <laughs> it's good. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>